so here we are. We're going to uh, be talking about trade. And I'm David First, and I chair the um, Food, Farming and Countryside Commission Devon Inquiry. I'm one of the commissioners nationally. And uh, trade is one of the issues that we are looking at in a series that we're calling Trade Unwrapped, which is a way in which we're trying to just understand from uh, people in a, in a sort of casual conversation what trade means to them and to uh, obviously their businesses as well. So I'm joined uh, uh, on this Zoom call today by Andrew Fremantle, um, who is a pig farmer. Um, I suppose I'd call you East Devon, Andrew, uh, yeah, yeah. in my general sort of geographical sense. And um, although uh, we haven't spent uh, time together, um, uh, I know uh, quite a lot about what you do. And, and as, a, as a pig farmer for, um, I think, four generations, uh, which is impressive, um, I know you've also uh, toyed with not only exporting, but also selling your produce direct to the public as well. So you've, you've been in and around the, in the marketplace and you've got some views. So we will, we will come back to that. So um, I don't know whether you want to add anything to, to, to that description of you, uh, but I hope that that does you justice. Uh, other than to say, you're, well, in my view, I hope, and it seems, certainly seems to be a successful business. Yeah, it's 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 you know it's not without its challenges running a pig farm uh, at the moment, but we've got a nice balance between producing pigs that we would sell as a normal pig farmer does, in to basically we all sell through marketing cooperatives to larger processors, so two thirds of my production would go the way a normal pig farmer would sell their pigs, and the other third we send to an ab one of the closest abattoirs to the to our farming operations, and it, they come back to uh, our home farm, Kenneford, and are uh, butchered down into all the things you can think of that you can eat that you get from a pig. And on, and to add to that, at six sites across Devon and Cornwall, we've got Kenneford catering kiosks at, um, at five at Mole Valley Farmers and one at Mole Aden Farmers open every day selling the food that we produce cooked and ready to go. So sausage yeah. baps, hog roast, bacon rolls. <clears throat> and uh, through that, we, we've, so we've got a nice balance. And uh, yeah, we're thankfully all those operations, even though we're in our third lockdown, are still all open. The Mole Valley, the agricultural cooperative retail branches that we trade in are open. And we've been ever so lucky. And, uh, but, 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 it's, but it's hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I can I can vouch for the product as somebody who has taken advantage of those catering outlets myself, and uh, and I'm still feeling good on it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and Greg, uh, uh, Greg Parsons, um, uh, we we are um, Greg and I uh, know each other a bit, um, and um, I think you describe yourself as a food veteran. Um, and uh, the reason we see each other is, is uh, particular is in, in looking at procurement and procurement of food. Uh, and I know that's something that's uh, been uh, important to you and, and getting a good, healthy food into uh, the institutional world um, uh, and, and allowing that to be an outlet uh, for uh, food producers in, in our part of Devon. So, uh, Greg. Um, I don't know whether that does you justice, um, but it, I hope is an introduction. I think it may be something more you want to add to that. No, I mean, I, I think the veteran bit is I've always worked in the food and drink um, sector um, from hospitality through to production, um, involved in agri-food for the last sort of 25, 30 years. Enjoyed many pork baps at Kenneford and enjoyed visiting the cafe out there as well. Thanks very much. Not far from where we live. Um, but no, I think that sort of sums it up. And I'm sure, you know, you'll learn a bit more. Um, about me through the the nature of this um, this Zoom. Okay, well that well, well that's good. Well, um, I just wanted to start off. I mean, uh, trade's been in in the um, news uh, um, a bit uh, around, particularly around the Brexit deal and so on. But most of the time, it isn't particularly in the news, um, and um, and that sort of could give one the impression that people don't care about about standards um, uh, and, uh, uh, and maintaining a sort of UK position as far as um, what we produce and what we import and what we eat. Um, could I just 
ask you what you think the British public think about our standards and what you think about the sort of sanctity of the standards that we apply uh, in the UK. Have you, uh, you, you'll have views, and I'll be very, very interested to hear what they are. Shall I go, David? Yeah, okay. Right, yeah, 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 sure. So, so um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think that um, it's, um, it's ever evolving um, in terms of uh, information provided to consumers. I think on the whole, it's very confusing. Um, and I think we're at a stage now, I think we're at a unique time for agri-food sector where there is so much change in such a small amount of time. We're coming off of, you know, hopefully coming off of the back of, you know, this horrible pandemic um, where the, we're, we're stepping into the new world of, of not being attached to the uh, European Union quite so uh, strongly. Um, and then we've got things like the Agricultural Bill and the Environmental Act that are all going to play a significant role in the future. So I think, you know, where I'm at now is, is what's in the past is can, can, can educate us and guide us towards now at this point in time, making sure that the standards that we look forward with are easily understandable by the consumer uh, and bought into are aligned with government strategy um, and bob on with what farmers um, and producers and processors and retailers are going to be um, uh, let's say, I would say incentivized, that's probably the wrong word, I think it's less penalized for. I think most critically, they're understandable to the producers, to people, you know, to people like Andrew, um, and they're relevant so that he, so that, so that they know what market they should be aiming for, what they need to do to get to that market, and also who's going to be buying at the other end of that. So I think, you know, we're at a transitional time. And, and on that, uh, Greg, on that business of, and who's going to be buying, um, uh, what, what feel do you get about the people, wh whether that be uh, institutional buying or whether that be individual buying, um, how much do you think that as we come through the pandemic and so on, that people are going to care enough about what they're buying, whether, whether as I say, whether it's a, a consumer or, or, or an institution? I think I think there is an awful lot of a lot of information flying around what what consumers think, and I think it's far too complicated. You know, we uh, we all eat as soon as we're brought into the world, and we continue eating until we're no longer in the world, don't we? So actually, people know more about food than we're ever giving credit for, and I think fundamentally, what people want to know, um, in line with uh, you know where we are, you know, at this current state of time, and you know, we know we've got a, a climate issue globally. That we need to start to address. I think what people want to know is, is that where they're buying their food from um, is um, at best, sorry, at least um, the food is produced in a sustainable way. At best, it's produced in a regenerative way. So, i.e., we're making the future better than where we are now. I think they want to. I think they want to know that animals are looked after. You know, relative to the fact that they're being bred the product to eat. But they want to know that animals are being looked after in that state and humanely cared for, um, and, and and you know, and then I, I think I think that beyond that, they want to um, know what they should eat in order to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, I, I struggle to sort of think that it's a lot less, a lot more complicated than that, David. No, okay. Well, I, I, and why don't we bring Andrew in? And, and I mean, you you're somebody who. Uh, probably has a, a good feel for what the consumer thinks because you know you've got them coming along to your food outlets. They understand what your what you know, what your food is that goes into those outlets. Um, what, what what do you think about the, the, the question of standards and 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 you, what what the public uh, who you know are buying your produce actually think? In my personal opinion, it boils down to what social economic group that in that each consumer is. I think the where we sell our hot food to people at the mole valley uh farmers where a lot of our customers are on our side and they're in food primary food production or they're working you know they're ancillary businesses that are buying materials to work on farms so they get it um i think a lot of people's food purchasing choices are on price and availability and are asking people to, you know, people 
there's a percentage of the population that aren't, I don't think are that worried about where the food comes from as long as it's cheap and nutritious and safe. And I as a farmer- I, Andrew, can I just chip in on that and say, do you think, I, I, I hear that, but do you think there is a, a, a minimum that they require or, or, or does that mean just not caring at all, provided that the, 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 the price is right? I mean, will, will, will someone say, do you think, uh, even if they're looking for cheap food, actually, I don't want to buy this because something, because it maybe the welfare isn't I, good? Yeah, I think um, maybe, you know, we're, our farm is assured under the Red Tractor Scheme. So maybe that as a minimum. But, you know, we've all heard of stories of supermarkets doing promotions and, you know, it used to be two chickens for five pounds mm. and they flew off the shelves. You know, so um, I maybe I'm a little bit cynical on it because I, I can see both sides of the, you know, I've seen, you know, we, the kiosk that where we sell our hot food that we are priced more than maybe going to Greg's or someone like that. But people go to us and we're busy because it's nice food. Yeah. Um, I spent the first 20 years of my pig farming career trying to be a higher welfare or a perceived higher welfare with straw and uh, using a lot more straw and uh, we didn't use fan crates to for the size to give birth in which basically meant that we produced a lot less pigs than we should have done and I look back now and wonder why on earth I did it because I would have still sell the same amount of stuff and it would have been a lot more efficient we'd have produced a lot more pigs for the same infrastructure and and so I'm a little bit well, not. I mean, we're still obviously a red tractor. We were Freedom Foods at the time, but I couldn't. I couldn't make it stack up, and we haven't yeah. lost any sales off the back of it. Um, it is a massive challenge to produce uh, food that has, you know, uh, wherever you know, it's sustainable. Produce food in a sustainable intensification. You know, that's what we're looking to do, isn't it? To be sustainably. Uh, increase because we've got to increase the amount of food we're going to produce anyway and less and also we've got to waste less um but i mean i've really dedicated my life to producing as much pig meat as i can with as least resources yeah. and do a bit of marketing on, on around the periphery of that as well and you know it hasn't stood me in good in bad stead to be honest no no um uh, and, uh, excuse me and that and that's uh uh, and that's a commercial view because otherwise you wouldn't be in business. So, so um, one has to think about the commercial imperative here. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of your product versus imported product, um, yes, I hear what you say about having the quantity and, and obviously uh, the outlets and so on. How do you see imported? uh pig meat well, this, there's a quite a big if it was european imported pig meat which 50 percent of the pig meat we in this country is imported because we're only you know halfway to being self-sufficient um that the vast majority of the farms that supply the uk are similar production systems to our uk indoor farms I mean, some of the Dutch and Danish farms might like to argue that they're higher. They, they might say we're using less antibiotics as an, an industry average. They might say we've got part slatted buildings. They might say um, we're, we've banned zinc already, which is a, a heavy metal that some farmers use in their piglet feed. Um, all of the things we don't do in this country yet. But then that said, this country, and you touched on it earlier, we did ban stalls and tethers in this country in... Uh, from the 1st of January of the year 2000 and other countries now use that happening as a textbook case of not what to do and what can happen if a country bans a production system that then doesn't then carries on the importation of the, the product from other countries that haven't and we basically exported our industry to all the countries that had a lower cost production because they were using it. And I read with interest, there was an article in one of the pig farming magazines at the beginning of this week, that in Canada, they, the, the things that we banned in the year 2000, they've just done a vote to put another five years on the transition. So they won't have to stop, they'll stop. They've got to 
they're attempting to stop using gestation stools by 2029. So that will be 29 years after we ban them, Canada are thinking of banning them. So if we were to then do a, a, I don't know, is it Mercure or a trade deal with Canada, we could be having pork and bacon in from that country that in a system that was banned uh, the 21 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, Greg, uh, in terms of your involvement with organisations that need to watch cost, and, and that very often is an institution that's having to feed people and having to do it at a certain cost, how do you, how do you think, uh, I mean, do you uh, uh, empathise with what Andrew is saying about the need to run a commercial business and to provide the food that people want at a price that people are prepared to pay. How, how, do, you, how do you think that um, higher standards could be rewarded by a higher price for the producer? I, mean, I was very taken by Andrew's comment that you know, he, he tried to do the sort of um, freedom farming type things early on and his I guess the sow litters were too small by the time he'd lost several uh, you know in each for each pig and all the rest of it so you know you, you come through with with um, uh, challenges to your business if you do and what, what, what what's your perspective on that? Um, yeah I think that we've jumped to the conclusion that the standards you know I think in, when asked the question earlier what what do I think people want what people want is to, to know that the animal has been treated in a humane way. Um, Andrew, I'm suggesting that you probably do treat your animals in a humane way, do you not? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, they, you know, yeah. they, if I don't look after them, they don't look after me. That's the point. Exactly right. So, so I didn't, I didn't mention David in my previous um, point, any, any standards. What I said is that, you know, I think that consumers want to be assured that we are doing the morally right thing. Um, and if that's wrapped up into a standard, if that is red track to where we are now, then that's what it is. I think maybe we just need to make it more transparent and make people more aware of what they're voting for. Because, you know, I think that there are so many badges on products um, that um, it, it's, it's confusing. So if we can look, if, if people like Andrew and in every other sector can look themselves in the mirror and say that actually what we're doing is um, it's humane, it's responsible, um, and we're doing what we can to contribute to a, you know, a better world going forward, then that's enough, isn't it? Um, to 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 in, ter in terms of the question relation to um, the institutions to public sector purchasing, well, the headline in the news today I think is is quite. Um, if you read sort of between the lines, you know what it says is that uh, you know a tier one government supplier of product is taking advantage of their contract, um, and uh, I'm talking about the the reference to the um, the Chartwell's part of Compass um, being given thirty pounds to to feed people that need food and only spending five. Um, you know, whichever variation of that you look at, it's made headline news for a reason. Um, so I think, I think we're very quick to jump to the conclusion that buying more locally, more responsibly through SMEs um, is more expensive because that's what people want us to hear. But is it really, you know, it, so uh, uh, how much in public sector in, in particular, what, what is the true comparison? Because it goes through a lot of, a lot of hands before it gets to, the, to people's mouths. And I think what we saw earlier in the year um, when we saw the likes of, um, you know, the, the 3663 breaks, you know, major, multi, major international companies with tier one contracts commissioned to supply um, boxes to vulnerable people, they were also in the press for a, uh, in a similar story. So I think we've got to be careful about the perception of, of price. Um, I, I think that if we don't um, get the right trade deals and we don't um, encourage um, responsible production, um, and sustainable production, which includes commercial sustainability, then um, it, prices are inevitably going to go up because there won't be the food around and it'll become more expensive because that's a market force. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, we are, we read stuff in the press, we're laid a bit by the press. Um, what, what do you think there is enough discussion about um, trade and the impact of trade and and do you think I mean I said at the beginning that you know people had focused on it a bit more around obviously the deal um, the, the exit deal from Europe but in general terms trade isn't something that particularly 
um, fires people up, I don't think, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, what your friends and the people you mix with and the, and the people you discuss things with, is trade an issue? Um, you know, are people interested in, in, in what happens um, to meet the market here and, and, and how the food retailers guarantee their supply of produce at the right price? Is, that, is it something that people discuss? Is it something that you know, is of interest to the public? Yeah, I think more now than ever, because we start to talk about food security. You know, we start to talk about the fact that we're 50% dependent on food coming into the country. Andrew? Yeah, I think people in the agricultural industry are aware of trade because it affects it affects the price they get for what they're producing. You know, my, uh, my cousin produces, he's lambing his sheep at the moment, and a topic of conversation over the lambing while I've been chatting to him during his lambing season is, what does he think he's going to get a uh, price for these lambs? Because while the ewes are actually giving birth, they, you know, the Brexit deal was being, you know, the Brexit deal was being done. And if it had been a no deal, the lambs could have been worthless. And if it was, you know, if, the, if they pushed the deal through and came up with a resolution, everything would be all right. And I, I, I notice now that lambs, have, the price of lamb has, has stayed steady and is going up. So, you know, he's been impacted by it. But for a person going into a shop and a supermarket and buying their lamb, I don't think they would be too aware of it unless there wasn't any lamb there. Then it was some of you, why on earth can't I have lamb this Easter? And then it might be a problem. And it's the same, you know, from a pig farmer perspective, we were kind of hoping some pig farmers, obviously not me, were hoping we didn't have a deal and we bounced out of the, of the EU without one because immediately then the 50, 60% of pig meat that came into this country would have a massive tariff slapped on it. And we were all rubbing our hands thinking, fantastic. Yeah. And in the end, we got a deal, boo hoo. And uh, it's a bit of chaos out there. The cull, all our cull sows, uh, which is a, a reasonable amount of money, but it's it's like 5% of our income as a, as a pig farmer. Um, they, no cull sows have gone at all. And apparently so they've tried to export, because no, they don't go across live. They go to some abattoirs in, in the East and then they're exported. And, and the, all this pig meat that we buy back comes back in the lorry. Um, the paperwork, the, the, the sorting out the paperwork took so long that the, the pig meat in the lorries went off and it had to come back to this country. So the side trade has stopped. So we're now <laughs> struggling a bit as pig farmers for the next quarter because uh, that's what the marketing group is saying, because it's a bit of chaos out there. Even though we've got, you know, the deal's been done and it's free trade, there's still the third country thing. And there was a lot, you know, the, if you can imagine that the lorry driver had to have his ham sandwich confiscated. Yes, because uh, uh, that was imagine that if that lorry that then it was full of pig meat getting that across. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah sure. it has been interesting, but we're kind of obviously all farmers are glass up full people, aren't they? Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the farming game. But we're hoping that it give us a couple of months, it will sort itself out, and and probably in the long run, a a, a, a deal to trade with the EU twenty seven is in our best interest. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I know that glass half full business. I mean, every year when I was farming actively here in Mid Devon, I said, I cannot see any way I'm not going to get four and a half tons an acre from this field. <laughs> yes. And year after year, there was a reason why I didn't, you know. But you, as you say, you stay, you stay positive, don't you? Greg, sorry, you were you were cut off then. I don't know what happened. You froze for a while. But can we come back to you and, and, and see what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how far I got, but you know, on, on one hand, I think people are more aware of um, they can't take for, for granted the food supply chains. Um, I think that you know, COVID has highlighted that. I think in Northern Ireland they'll be very, they'll be feeling that you know greatly at the moment um, because of what's 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 happening over there. Um, and I think as well on the other side of it, you know, and I'd like to think or I know again from from evidence in, in our own business um, that people are um, prepared to seek out better products. Um, whilst they're stuck at home um, and, you know, and, and maybe buying more food online or via their local farm shops or their local village high streets rather than going to the multiple retailers um, for whatever reason. Um, you know, and, and I kind of hope that, that some of that sort of sticks as well because you know, it, for artisan producers, of which we are one, you know, that, that's, um, that's uh, hopefully going to go some way to compensate for perhaps what would be more difficult exporting markets um, in the future. 
So, so um, if one if one looks at local um, sourcing, and uh, Andrew, I guess that from your point of view, your local sourcing is. I mean, you you go a step beyond in that you then actually cater and have catering outlets. But presumably, you you also do you sell your uh, um, uh, your pig meat um, locally as well, not necessarily catered. Um, yes, uh, uh, yes, so um, we supply, we don't, we're not doing it to a massive scale, we supply, well Mole Valley farmers themselves buy our sausages, pork and bacon to sell in their retail branches, some uh, three branches do, and we've got a few village shops, and we haven't rolled it out massively, one because we'll let, run out of facilities to do it in, we'll, we'll get, well maybe we'd get large enough facilities, and the other thing is when you're a primary producer producing things to sell on it's very difficult to balance the carcass because if say we've got extra chiefs down the road from us and I'd love to be able to supply them but you know back in normal times they would do a thousand meals and if pork tenderloin was on the menu they'd want a thousand portions of pork tenderloin well I couldn't do that as a primary producer selling my pork on I would have to buy in a lot of pork tenderloin to add to mine to make it up to the thousand portions you see so it's tricky so we've kind of grown it little by little just to keep going along and it's a, you know we've got the butchery team down there and it keeps them busy and we have uh in the last three months rather belatedly set up an online farm shop as well and that yeah and and as greg said i think we uh smaller independent food producers or independent food producers have been given a golden opportunity to connect to the consumers through the internet it's become a lot more commonplace isn't it and as we saw in the first lockdown yeah. there isn't enough yeah. internet infrastructure out there if a, if a reasonable majority of the country want to shop online and our local food sailor to us uh he had to pivot his business because he was all his um, catering customers had to shut and now he's, he's probably looking back saying what a fantastic opportunity this has been and i saw him the other day bumped into him on the road and they've got 600 customers they now deliver to on a weekly basis yeah yeah well i i i i, I know of um, of somebody in in this part of devon who pivoted their business had to because yeah, they had 70 people employed and 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 they were they were servicing the, the food service industry and it just disappeared overnight and and they are now a um you know an online delivery business um uh he you know i think getting into it he he tells me you know he's had it, it's competitive and and actually yeah. he what he's done is kept the business going he hasn't been particularly profitable yet but it's but he saved his business by doing it. So um, you know, but I but I'm just wondering, you know, um, the 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 as we come out of COVID, the local flavour, the local feel for supporting the farms down the road or the farms in the village or the farms nearby. Um, do you think that that has changed? Do you think we now have a different attitude to supporting? Um, people producing nearby. I mean, with pigs, you know, uh, I guess because it, they're housed inside, you don't see them in the fields in the same way, perhaps as you might um, with, with other livestock, for example. But but ha are we likely to change or will we just revert back to what we were before? Has COVID altered anything, do you think? I, th I, I, think, think. It, I think it has changed. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I think it has changed, and I think the 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 one of the easiest ways to see that it's changing is the rise of the milk vending machine. Yeah. Uh, and I I go back the countryside now, delivering to our kiosks, and I see past three of them now. And I think that's a good example. If you see the cows out grazing in the paddocks, and then you know close by, you can pop in, and, and it's recyclable with the bottles. And I think. I think more things like that, where there's that close connection, I think it's definitely is going to increase in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we are converts to the milk vending machine, I have to say, and, uh, you know, it's, but... Um, it's, a good, so, it's a good point, Dave. How much do you pay for your milk from the milk vending machine? Well, I pay uh, probably more. Now, what am I paying? One pound 
15 or something like that. For a litre? Yeah. And how much is four pints of milk in te- I've cheated, so I've looked this up because I thought it might be relevant. Yeah, no, well, I mean, discussion. Do you remember the politician? Do you remember Jim Pace got caught yeah, out yeah, on yeah. this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, no, because I haven't been buying it recently in, a, in, but, in, uh, in, in the supermarket differently. So I've lost yeah. track of what that is. But, but to, to both the points, you know, what, I'm, what I think is really important is I think people have become more aware of the food that's around them. I think they've, they've also become more aware of the qualities within them. I think, you know, they will also become more aware of how they're produced as we move forward. But I think what is, is important that we that the values are, are sort of maybe restructured a little bit, because I think people do buy from a uh, milk from a more local source, be it off farm or even from their local shops, because they want milk. And actually, it's you can see it there and drink it here. So, yeah. so, so, and, and, you know, it, but if you talk to the, the people that um, provide the food for over 80% of the UK consumers shoppers, they'll tell you that people will come to their store to shop because of their milk price, you know, and they're selling their milk at less than 50 pence a litre, yeah, yeah. Know, which, which cripple is, which is crippling because what we've seen over time is that the retailer's margin has increased. And, and uh, you know, and, and from single digit, probably to nearing sort of, sort of 45, 50%. Whereas the, and the producers is, is at best stayed flat, if not decreased over that yeah, time. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so I think it's, that's an important thing. Stories like that and things like that happening, hopefully will make people more aware and can have a long-term effect on people getting the right price for the, for the right product. You know, you know, I, I looked, at, I cheated and looked at eggs as well, you know, and, and, and you can buy an egg for eight pence in, 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 in the biggest retailer we have in this country. Is that the right price? Is that is that actually sustainable for anybody apart from the retailer? I I don't know. I I got I've, I got a pound an egg uh, at a charity auction, uh, but I I the condition was that I, I they had to catch it and I sold them individually out of the box. And one person uh, it went all over their suit and <laughs> trouble. So I'm a bit careful about doing that in the future. But uh, yeah. uh, we have to. You know, um, uh, so, so, um, so in terms of, um, yeah, I'm trying to trying to bring it to a conclusion. Um, you know, what I'm taking from this is, is um, you know, Andrew's very strong view that you know, if the commercials don't work, then the whole business isn't going to work, and I, I completely take that point. Um, uh, that that sometimes when you try to do things that you think the public are going to think are great. You, you don't necessarily make up the difference in what you lose by, by, by actually having to do it in that way. So the lesson perhaps from a farming point of view is that we have to find ways where the, 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 the standards bit is not uh, uh, disconnected from uh, the actual production so that you still manage to produce a profitable product um, even though you're uh, operating at high standards, and that and that is a challenge, particularly I guess in the in, in the pig industry. Um, yeah, I, I think the other yeah the other thing I that ought to be mentioned is that the yeah it may be I mean I'm thinking of Mary Quick and her cheese operation when I say this that you know by all accounts she ex, she's been a fantastic uh, she's been fantastic done fantastically well at exporting her cheese but if I wanted to export some of my pork products there isn't an export abattoir in the southwest that would be that would be that has the facilities the only one you know and the one it's an economy to scales thing you know they're processing 30 40 50 thousand pigs a week and if I went up to you know it's just not going to happen it you know we you know that's why I'm concentrating obviously on the in on the home market but You've got, if we're going to try and export things that we produce on our West Country farms, we need the facilities to do yeah. them in before we start. Yeah, and, and, the, and the abattoir question has been going, you know, for a while now. And uh, so, uh, Greg, any thoughts on, on abattoirs? And um... I mean, it's like everything in the chain, it's got to be sustainable, unless it's, uh, I don't know whether you've touched on it, unless it's, um, you know, it's going to be centrally funded, you know, and, and yeah, I, I think that, that will be a challenge to potentially a growing market for more small, you know, for, for smaller produced, more specialist products, won't it? Mm. Um, you know, so it, it, it's. I, I think these these are big questions that infrastructure questions that that now you know that need to be surfaced now, and 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 there should be some, you know, some um, political um, uh, and industry 
um, sort of discussion around how, how they're resolved. I mean, Greg, for example, um, and the government ha is, uh, as it reduces the payments um, uh, to farmers, uh, you know, basic payment scheme and so on, they are, they, they said that they're going to try and keep the money in the industry, but they're just not going to give it uh, you know, willy nilly and uh, under the old BPS rules. Um, do you see some of this infrastructure that you've just mentioned as being necessary for us to be able to compete internationally and also satisfy our own market as well? I mean, I'll, you know, and because it seems to me that it's beyond, I mean, unless you get unless it works for a business to invest in abattoirs and and i guess all the additional red tape and costs have been part of the challenge of that um then then should there be some government uh, uh help with that and and will that help us to export and and i mean taking andrew's point i mean are we, are we uh, should this be something that there is more lobbying going on should there be more on this yeah I I think we started to touch on the previous point is that, you know, I think we should reevaluate the value chain, you know, and perhaps identify, you know, where firstly, how, how that sort of share of, of, of margin is being distributed and perhaps there's some fat in there that can, that can uh, uh, reinvest towards infrastructure. But if, if there, if there aren't, uh, if there isn't an ability for primary producers to produce sustainably you know sustainability starts with commercial commercial sustainability doesn't it because you can't do the rest of the stuff if you're not around um and if there isn't um a uh, an opportunity to market then then simply the the produce the primary producers won't be there so you won't need the abattoirs but because they won't be there but i think we've got to twist that around and say actually we need primary producers to be to be in place because we're too dependent on imported food products um and we also want to we want to be standing firm and be able to take, make the most of international trade deals. So therefore, what are we going to do about it? You know, what have we got versus what we need? Yeah, we, we're doing some work with the NFU as part of this Southwest Food Hub project to try and um, establish what capacity um, we have, both in terms of primary production, but you know, even more importantly, in processing, to understand what we can produce. I don't think that's readily understood. Um, maybe people like AHDB have a bit of an inclination. But I don't think it's it's easily accessible. No. Uh, Andrew, any thoughts on that? I think, um, yeah, I think there is obviously there is as speaking as a primary producer, there is a worry that the government will, in their in their um, keenness to reduce the UK's carbon emissions, will export UK agriculture to other food producing countries and then they can claim to you know we've reduced the UK's carbon footprint but we've done it by exporting our manufacturing base you know and that that there has to be this balance between you know doing some real wilding and taking out the marginal land out of production but then still making the most of our best land and our best farmers and and I know that when I talk to the people, you know, we have a consultant that comes in that works very closely with us and some other big far big farmers in the air, well, all over the country, he's very successful. And it, his mantra to us all the time is just to concentrate on producing as much pig meat as you can for as cheaply as possible. Don't worry about anything else because they're the only things really you can control and bring your care, you know, have a constant battle to reduce your cost of production and just try and keep that you know, as low as you can. And then it will, you know, you'll you'll do you'll always, even in the bad times, you'll still do okay. And that's that's you know, I know it's blinkered and we've got to be looking at the bigger picture. Well, it's focused. I think it's yeah. focused. You say it's blinkered, yeah. it's actually focused, it's business focus. And 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 yeah. whatever you do in business, focus is pretty key, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, our, the only way farmers can battle through low prices is produce more of what they're doing for a lower price and it, that doesn't really help sometimes does it because we're putting it's the survival of the fittest then isn't it you're almost willing your neighbor to go bust so that the, the the you know the supply and demand comes back into kilter but you know that some of the most successful farmers will tell you that all well, they just concentrate on that yeah and, and do you think uh, uh, carbon has been raised do you think carbon is going to be something which has uh, the public interested if in terms of what 
the, the very fair point that has uh, been made about exporting uh, the problem overseas, should we be um, uh, focusing more on the carbon footprint of overseas businesses in, 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 in imports? Should, should food retailers be saying more about carbon footprints in, 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 in what is on their shelves? Is that, a, is that an issue? Is that an advantage for us? Is that, would that be good? Definitely. I mean, it's not going to go away, is it? You know, I mean, and, and I mean, there'll be, there, there's lots of um, uh, ways in which people can offset, but, you know, I think, you know, you've got to come back and to, to, to the basics uh, of, uh, you should be self, you know, you should be self-responsible and know what is expected of you. Um, and, you know, in the case of the future, you know, be rewarded for the efforts that you make to um, meet what is required. Um, on the other side of that, you know, it, it should be, it shouldn't be easy and it should be costly to not be part of where we need to get to. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Andrew, anything on carbon? I think, yeah, I think um, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with carbon footprinting because you've got to look at the whole life cycle of the product. Yeah. I mean, they're obviously... Through the summer, we can obviously grow fantastic crops of strawberries here without the need of greenhouses and, you know, artificial inputs. But on the shoulder months, we can't. So the overall life cycle, or the carbon cycle of imported Spanish strawberries or wherever they come from might be lower than forcing them to be grown in the UK. I think you need to take a balanced view to it. Um, the... You know, pig farmers are quite smug in this because pork, you know, pig and poultry farmers, uh, you know, don't make a big noise about this because we are, even though, you know, well, my pigs are fed Argentinian soya that we buy from Mole Valley farmers. So we're not kind of part of this deforestation battle. We're sustainably sourced. But pig, pigs and poultry convert other proteins into their protein very, very efficiently. So the, the carbon footprint of our, the, the protein I produce is pretty low. And then you couple that with solar panels on our piggery roofs, which we've got uh, a wood chip boiler that heats all the piglets to keep them warm. We're pretty, we're pretty, um, you know, we're pretty, but we could be a lot better. There's a lot of things we could do. And I do love, I've got a friend of mine that's got a big dairy farm in Scotland with an AD plant coupled next to it. And he's written a field scholar, he'll go ahead. And he has now put a massive greenhouse next to his AD plant to run off the carbon monoxide that comes out, or carbon dioxide that comes out of the generator powered by the gas from the AD. And he's now a big tomato grower as well in Scotland. Now that's yeah. the type of, that's where, that's the type of thing that the single farm payment should be morphed into schemes like that. I'd love to see every, if it was feasible, which I think it is, every every livestock farm in the country have a small anaerobic digestion plant on it. Yeah, um, I think at that point, I, can I thank you both very much? I mean, great to have the conversation. Um, we haven't necessarily changed the world, but it's been a really interesting debate, particularly from your own personal experiences which uh, which really add to it so so thank you both very much